Welcome on in, Eagles fans, to the No Huddle Show, our Philadelphia Eagles podcast right here on NJ.com. I'm Joe Giglio, joined as always by Elliot Shore Parks. And last week we said goodbye to one of our co-hosts on the show, Mark Eckel, who is off to retirement. And now this week we bring aboard a new co-host, Matt Lombardo, who will be covering the Eagles along with Elliot for NJ Advanced Media. Matt, welcome, uh, welcome to the podcast here. Joe, Elliot, happy to be here. I know this is, what, episode 63, but I feel like it's episode one of a new era. That's right. So we're going to try to take this to an even bigger level that we've, than we've done so far. And we've had a lot of fun so far on this podcast uh, through these first 62 episodes. We bring you aboard starting now, and it's a good time to start here with the NFL draft later this month. And so much going on with the Eagles with that 14th pick. And Elliot, to start this episode, you got you were just out in Phoenix, Arizona last week mm-hmm. with the owners meetings, right? And there were a couple NFL rule changes. But, you know, from an Eagles perspective, the interesting storylines were both Jeff Lurie and Doug Peterson speaking. And, and for Doug, it was the first time we heard him since his, I guess, end of game press conference in week 17 against the Cowboys. For Lurie, it was the first time we heard him and basically – a year before yeah. we get to the draft stuff and and all the stuff moving forward with this number fourteen pick, what were your takeaways being out there and hearing those guys speak for the first time in a while? Well, the big news I thought was Larry. I mean, Doug talked and you know he talked for an hour and there was definitely a few takeaways there in terms of you know you can kind of read between the lines with Doug more than you can Howie and, and Larry just because Doug's a little newer at dealing with this type of thing. But in terms of Larry, I mean, my biggest I guess I had two two takeaways. The last time we we heard uh, we heard him talk was when he was announcing the hiring of Doug Peterson. So you know, over a year ago. But even then, that was you know mostly Doug kind of talk. So the last time Jeffrey really talked talked for a while was when he was firing Chip. And that day, he clearly was not a happy man. You know, he was admitting he made a mistake um, and all those things. So my biggest takeaway from from hearing him down in Arizona was. He is much happier with where this franchise is heading right now. And a lot of that, I mean, maybe 90% of it has to do with the, with the fact that they have Carson Wentz. I mean, he talked on and on and on about how important getting the quarterback is. And now they feel they have that guy and how impressed he was with Carson and how they have to surround him with talent. And if you're Carson Wentz and you're listening to that, the two, the two takeaways as, as Carson, I would take is, one, this team is going to do literally everything that they can to make sure I succeed. And you, you've seen that a little bit already this offseason with the signings of Alshon Jeffrey and, you know, Torrey Smith. But the second takeaway is if he doesn't, if he didn't feel like a franchise quarterback last year, there is no question he is this team's franchise. He's not just their franchise quarterback. He is literally their franchise. I mean, everyone's job in that outside of Jeff Lurie, everyone's job in that place is going to live and die with Carson. Everyone had a hand in drafting him and it's going to be everyone's job to make, make sure he succeeds. Now it's going to be another probably year or two before we have a real good feel of how good he is. But listening to Lurie, it's clear that they are absolutely 100% all in on Carson Wentz. And Doug kind of, you know, said that as well. Um, so that was my biggest takeaway from the meetings um, in terms of just, you know, yeah, Carson, well, we all knew he was important to this franchise, but it's no brainer. Now this guy is absolutely locked in everything to, to, um, to everyone in that building. Matt, what do you think about the direction the Eagles have gone and really gone out of their way uh, with this whole off season to make what Elliot's just saying there, what we're talking about, right? It's all about Carson Wentz. One, Matt, and the way they've built this team, the moves they've made so far, the free agent moves and going out and getting a couple wide receivers and, and who knows, maybe they go offense in the first round again. But on top of that, just every time, you know, whether it's Howie or Jeff speaks, it's all about Carson. Do you like that approach, Matt? Yeah, well, Joe, I think that what they're doing, and, and you said it perfectly right there, is that they're trying to bolster the talent around Carson Wentz by any means necessary, whether that's bringing in Jeffrey and Torrey Smith in free agency. I still think there's a chance that they draft a running back or a wide receiver sometime in the first two or three rounds. And, and I think that this is really a critical year for Carson Wentz. And you look back to Tom Brady, and I'm not saying that Carson Wentz is going to be Tom Brady or see anywhere close to that level of success, but the monumental leap from Tom Brady year one to Tom Brady year two, you saw the completion percentage go up. You saw his confidence on the field continue to go up. You saw his leadership take on an even larger role within that Patriots organization. And I think what the Eagles are trying to do this offseason is set Carson up 
to make the sort of mechanical changes and improvements that he has to make during the offseason, whether that's improving the hitch in his throwing motion, improving the footwork that we heard all of the talk about dating back to his first OTA practice last spring, that for Carson Wentz, once he improves, the supporting cast around him is going to be there to not only aid in that improvement, but help this team take the next step forward. And I think that it, on the whole, it's, it's a solid philosophy for developing a quarterback I don't know yet, Joe and Elliot, whether it's the most prudent strategy to building and developing a football team, because you look across the NFC East and just the wide receivers alone in this division, you have Des Bryant, you have Odell Beckham Jr. You, you look at, you know, the Giants bringing in, you know, Brandon Marshall. They still have Sterling Shepard. There's a lot of talent outside at the wide receiver position. There's a lot of talent at the quarterback position and Eli Manning and Dak Prescott and in Kirk Cousins, whether Eagles fans like it or not, Kirk Cousins has played some of the best football of his career the last two years. And while I think it's prudent to add the talent around Carson Wentz, they're going to need to bolster this defense if they're going to take any pressure in game off of Wentz and put this team in a position to not have to win games 42 to 35 every single week. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, the NFC's quarterbacks are good. I mean, most most divisions don't have four quarterbacks like this. Even if we exclude Wentz, the other three are good quarterbacks. They're veterans, have been there a while with Eli or Cousins has been really good the last couple of years and obviously what Prescott did last year. Elliot, when you look at what Matt just said, and obviously the other side of the ball they haven't fixed yet, right? And, and Patrick Robinson, we're not going to count him as fixing the, the, the cornerback situation. Do you, do you like the idea that they're right now it's just been offense, offense, the one side of the football when it comes to – the bigger moves, and then we can look forward to the draft, too, with this, at number 14. Or do you think they have to be more balanced, or, or should they just try to fix Wentz's side first, and then they'll figure out defense later? Well, the one thing I'll say before I get into that is the idea that Patrick Robinson isn't their version of fixing it. I don't know if you know we should be sh- so sure about that. Last year, they signed Leotis McKelvin, and you know, me, you, and Mark at the time talked about how that, oh, it's just going to be a role player. He's just going to be a backup. He was our number one cornerback throughout the season as long as he was healthy. A good Patrick point. Robinson's a veteran. Um, you know, he, he has started on both sides. So I, I think the idea that he's not going to play a big role on this defense next year, I, I disagree with that. I, I think they view him as somebody that's going to come in and be able to play. Now, that's not saying much because he had a worse year last year than Nolan Carroll did. Now he's played better football at times than Nolan Carroll, but last year he was worse than Nolan Carroll and essentially got benched. So, I mean, yeah, I, I think Patrick, Rob, Patrick Robinson is going to end up playing quite a bit. But in terms of, you know, what, what do you do offense or defense in the draft? I see Matt's points about the, the receivers. Obviously, the NFC East probably has some of the best receivers out there. My only thing is, and not to sound like a GM or head coach, I really do think they should take best available player at 14. I agree. And the way it's shaking out, I think that's going to end up being an offensive player. Um, you know, the, the injury to Sidney Jones from Washington certainly hurt because he would have made a lot of sense there or would have at least f- caused another cornerback to fall. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you look at what what's going to potentially be available at 14, I think it's going to end up being an offensive player. And so then you say, all right, well, do you reach for a cornerback or a defensive end because the, the defense has been so ignored? I don't think that's the way to go about it because like you said, Joe, you know, if you can, you know, add a, a John Ross from Washington, a Dalvin Cook from Florida State, um, you know, someone like that at 14, even OJ Howard from Al- Alabama, you're talking about now an offense that's going to feature you know, a lot of really talented players. You go from Jordan Matthews being last year the team's top option, even though he was a, a slot receiver, he was probably their top option on offense, to being four or five. Um, so I really think that, you know, at, drafting a cornerback at 14, yeah, if Marlon Humphrey from Alabama falls, that would that would make some sense. Um, but people, you know, I wouldn't take Tredavious White from LSU at 14. I wouldn't take Gary on Conley from Ohio State at 14. I think that would be the definition of reaching because really no matter who you take, even if they take Marshawn Lattimore, I mean, you, you can't go into next year knowing – you can't go into next year expecting one cornerback – taken in the first round to completely fix this defense. And well, I'm not saying that one corner would fix the defense. And I, I agree, Elliot, that you should mm-hmm. certainly go best player available. And as you build your board, I, I think that they need to look at talent regardless of position. But right. if you're sitting there and the number one player on your board is who's left is say Gary and Conley or Christian McCaffrey, or that it's Marlon Humphrey or Delvin Cook. And you, you don't see a minuscule difference between the 
two, I think that if, if you take the corner or you take the edge rusher, you're going to give some help. And while that's not going to fix your defense, it's going to put you one step closer to having that complete unit on that side of the ball, which we all know they've given up more yards on the outside than any team in football. Their pass rush only got 35 sacks a year ago. I think that you need to give some attention, whether that's in round one or later, to that side of the football, or you're yeah. going to be in a position where all of Carson Wentz's mistakes this year or anything he does to improve incrementally, it's not going to make as much of a difference because he's going to have to still throw the ball 50, 60 times a game because they're going to be playing from behind. So almost taking a defensive player or multiple defensive players still helps out Carson Wentz because you take that in-game pressure off of him. Yeah, I know. I, I, I agree that if all things are equal, you know, they need help on the defensive side of the ball more than do the offensive side. The only, the only counter I would make just to play a devil's advocate sure. would be next year at the end of this, if we're doing the, you know, we're doing this podcast a year from now, the Eagles are better off if, you know, they, they would have finished, you know, nine or seven or eight and eight, but they lost a lot of shootouts. And you could say, look, this offense is fixed for years to come. We have Alshon Jeffrey, who looks like will be back if we can say that this time next year. Zach Ertz, Jordan Matthews, you know, maybe Dalvin Cook, maybe a John Ross, some, something like that. If you know that offense is set and Carson Wentz is succeeding for that, I think you're better in the long term than you are adding one one player at 14. I mean, I think the offense is closer to being completed. I, I agree. If if all things are equal and and a Marlon Humphrey's there, I think I'm you know I would never rip that pick. I'm not saying it doesn't make any sense. I just think that the way I, I see the draft board shaking out so far, it looks like the best option there will be on offense as opposed to uh, defense. I think. You know, defense, you know, we, we never know what's going to happen. But I think there's a, if they take a defensive player at 14, I think there's a better chance they're reaching there than I would if they took an offensive player. To go off of what Laurie said, and then we'll get back more into this draft stuff and, and kind of thoughts on where they are at 14, you know, a couple weeks out from this draft. But I want to get this, your thoughts on this one thing that Laurie said at the owners meetings last week. And this is the quote. It takes a very patient, disciplined approach. And he was talking about how to build a team, right? How to get this team to where they want to go. And he went on about short-term solutions without a quarterback. Not sustainable. But it's, it's the beginning of that quote. The, it takes a very patient, disciplined approach. Matt, what did you make of that from, from the owner? You know, when I hear patience from an owner, the, the thing I think of is kind of lowering the expectation, not trying to get everyone excited they're going to win 12 games next year, which – I think we all agree they're not going to win 12 games next year. They're not there yet. But I don't think in the NFL, when you have a quarterback, right, and, and you did win seven games last year, like, not like they won three games last year, I don't think the idea of this team competing for a playoff spot, and if that's nine wins, it's nine wins. But I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. What did you think about the patient comment from Jeff Lurie? Do you agree with them, or do you think there should be some expectations to try to win football games in 2017? Yeah, Joe, I think that this year is all about the continued development of Carson Wentz, like I talked about earlier. And I think that that's the mindset that Jeffrey is taking. And I think that Jeffrey looks out across the rest of the division and he sees what the Cowboys have in place and the fact that they can, without question, go into this draft focusing on the defense. You look at the Giants, couple of holes here, couple of holes there. You look at the Redskins and if they can bring Kirk Cousins back for a long-term deal at some stage, they're kind of set up to compete where you look at this Eagles team and you need that long-term developmental wide receiver. You need that running back because right now, let's face it, Wendell Smallwood, as high as they are on him, and Darren Sproles, that's not going to be a reliable ground attack. The offensive line needs a long-term solution to replace Jason Peters or replace Lane Johnson when Johnson moves to the left-hand side. Defensively, you need to get an edge rusher. You need to get one or two corners. You need a linebacker. So I think that Joe Jeffrey sees all of these needs, all of these holes, and I think that while they might internally be hoping to take that next step, they might be internally hoping that maybe they win two of those one score games that they lost a year ago and that pushes them to that nine and seven, maybe ten and six mark. But I think that realistically, Jeffrey's trying to dial back the expectations of the fans that just because you have Carson Wentz, just because you added Alshon Jeffrey and Torrey Smith and whatever you end up adding in the draft later this month, that this is not a team in his belief. And I do believe that 
that he's more hands-on and involved in the football side of things than he's ever been before. I think that in his mind, he's trying to set the expectations for the fans. Listen, this isn't going to be a 10 or 11 win team this season, but if we can take a step forward this year, fill some holes this year that we can go into next offseason when we have oodles and oodles of cap space to be a player in free agency again and add to the draft and then next season the 2018 season is the year where expectations need to be in Carson Wentz's third season and in Doug Peterson potentially his third season that's when the expectation levels need to rise or else let's be honest guys if they don't exceed those expectations next year if Carson Wentz doesn't improve this year they're in a boatload of trouble. I mean, I think to me that my takeaway was when you talk about patience is let's if, if last year when they fired Chip and they hired a new, I mean, basically a new general manager and it wasn't Howie Roseman, we wouldn't be talking about patience at this point, really. I mean, we would be talking about them building and there wouldn't be the expectations in a lot of ways to, you know, be a playoff team right away. But I think because they basically brought back Howie. And, you know, he made the trade for Wentz, which was a good trade. But you're looking at a GM that's been in some sort of control for, you know, five or six years and has never won a playoff game. So I think that's one of the reasons why Lurie felt they need to preach preach patience is he was talking about Howie. I mean, I think when you, if you talk to Eagles fans or really almost anybody about this team, the biggest reservation now, I think last year it was Doug. This year, I, I think Doug showed enough his his uh, first year to kind of ease some of those uh, so those fears. But I think the biggest thing people are, are hesitant about with this team is Howie, whether he can build the team, whether he can, you know, fill all these holes we've just talked about. So when Jeffrey Lurie's preaching, preaching patience, I think he's saying, you know, give Howie a chance to fix this. And, you know, whether or not he'll be able to do it, I don't know. But if, if he was, you know, if, if they had brought in Joe Douglas last year to be the guy, not just, uh, you know, not just Howie's number two, but there was no Howie Roseman in the picture and Joe Douglas was running this himself, I don't think we'd be preaching patience as much because it would be clear that this team is is just starting to rebuild. They have a new new head coach, new GM. But because Howie's still there, I think, you know, Jeffrey Lurie clearly doesn't you know, I think he was trying to preach that look, give this guy a chance to do it, even though I think people are skeptical of his ability to get the job done. I think he views almost Howie Roseman as that new general manager. Mm-hmm. This is apparently Howie Roseman two point oh. Right. We know that he's been here for five, six, seven years, hasn't won a playoff game, right? But I think that in Jeffrey's eyes this isn't the make or break year yet for Howie. This this is kind of step one of a multi-pronged rebuild. And I think that when he says be patient, let, let's face it, guys, if they win seven or eight games this year, there are going to be a lot of calls and maybe rightfully so for the head of Howie Roseman. And if Carson Wentz doesn't fix that hitch in the throwing motion, if he doesn't get more comfortable in the pocket, if he starts the way that he finished last year and doesn't get better, then I think there are going to be calls for the head of Doug Peterson, and I think that Jeffrey is just kind of laying the groundwork that this is going to be another year where it's about developing Carson, and we're not yet all that concerned about playoff success. That, that was just my takeaway. It's going to be interesting to see how, when, when the season plays out, how, how, like you just said, Matt, how that, the idea of patience, even though everyone probably going into the season will say they're probably not there yet, how that'll jive with, you know, how they're actually playing on the field. All right, so we are just about three or so weeks away, depending on when you actually listen to this episode here, from the first round of the NFL draft on that Thursday night in Philadelphia, which is going to be really cool and seems like everyone's trying to get tickets to that thing. You guys are going to be there, obviously, and the Eagles are going to be there with the 14th pick. Now, for the per- and we'll get into some offensive stuff, the defense stuff, and really a lot of in-depth on the players that might end up in Philadelphia the next couple weeks, but for for this episode, I want to touch on this, Elliot, the idea of the Eagles sitting at 14 and either moving up or moving down, right? They could just stay at 14. They could take a player there, and there's going to be some good ones for them. But 14, I think, is an interesting spot where you're not that far from the top 10 if you really want to get there. At the same time, you get to 14, and the guy or two you wanted isn't there, and you think you get a similar player at 22, 23. That idea of trading down exists. Where do you sit in – and if you had a pick, what do you think is more likely for the Eagles on April 27th, a move up or a move down if they were going to do anything? It's a tough question. I mean, on the to the first part of your question, it, it's hard to say because obviously we don't know who's going to be there. So I could say, you know, I think they should trade down. And then on draft night, Mike Williams is there. And obviously in that case, I wouldn't. But the way I look at it now, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, is, you know, 
I I think for, if I'm the Eagles, you know, barring something crazy happening, you I think they're they're better off trading back than they are trading up. I mean, if I'm trading up, you know, I used to say I would trade up for Mike Williams. Now, you know, Alshon yes is only a one year player, but I don't know if I want to give up resources to draft a player to move up to take a player like Williams. Um, you know, who has kind of a very similar skill set to Alshon. Um, you know, Marshawn Lattimore, obviously the corner cornerback of Ohio State. Yeah, he he is the best cornerback in this draft and would, you know, fill obviously a massive need. Depends where he falls. I mean, some people have him as high as number two to San Francisco. I don't think it's going to cost as much to trade up this year as it did last year because there's no quarterbacks at the top of the draft, and that always increases the price. But if I'm the Eagles, I mean, I'm not, you know, you don't have a second-round pick next year. I don't want to give up my first and second round pick this year. To, I don't want to use both of those picks on one player. If I want two players out of those picks. So I, I wouldn't give up the two. Um, you have two fours, but I don't think one and a four is going to get you up to anywhere of, of substance. I mean, if you're talking about trading up one or two spots, maybe. But So if I'm the Eagles and I'm sitting there at 14, I'm more likely to trade back. I mean, I like John Ross out of Washington. If he was there, I would take him. But if, you know, let's say John Ross, Mike Williams, Humphrey, um, Let's say they're all gone. Uh, then you're sitting there. I mean, maybe you could take a Dalvin Cook. Maybe you take McCaffrey. I don't like Derek Barnett out of Tennessee that much, so I would take him at 14. Um, so if I'm the Eagles, I'm looking at, look, it's a deep running back draft, a deep cornerback draft. Maybe I move back with, uh, let's say, Houston, who needs who needs a uh, quarterback. Maybe they want to go up and uh, get a Trubisky or a Deshaun Kaiser or Deshaun Watson. I add maybe a second-round pick or, an, or, or a third-round pick. Then I have more picks. I'm still picking in the first round. And, you know, we've spoken a length about all the holes on this team. So I think the Eagles need to – add more picks as opposed to lose them. Obviously at 14, if you think you have a clear difference maker there, someone who's very high on your board, then you take them, obviously. But I, I, when, you, when I look at how it's shaping, I would be okay with trading back because I think a guy like Dalvin Cook, who's falling now, is an, is, is an instant impact player, and you can probably get him in the 20s at this point. So I, I would definitely be open to trading back by the Eagles. Yeah, I, I agree. And I don't think that there's a player outside of maybe a Marshawn Lattimore Elliott, as you pointed out. Let's say he slides to pick seven or pick eight, and you can get up and maybe surrender a fourth-round pick to go get him. I don't think he falls that far, but if he does, and if he's truly the number one player on your board, then obviously you go and get him. But they're kind of in that sweet spot where you're probably going to have your pick between between uh, a pass rusher like a Barnett or a Hassan Reddick, or maybe Reuben Foster tumbles down the board, unlikely. Christian McCaffrey could be there, the running back. Ross, the wide receiver that I know you love, Elliot. You could have Conley sitting there at 14. So there are a lot of players that you want, but there aren't a lot of teams behind you if there is a quarterback who falls. There aren't that many quarterbacks in that three or four pick range behind you that are going to want to jump up to 14. So I think that they're kind of in that best sweet spot for what they need to take an impact player and there are only so many impact players in every draft and you're probably going to get the most pro bowlers in the first round out of your top 15 or 16 selections so if I'm the Eagles I'm with you Elliot if I'm moving I'm moving back to pick up a couple of picks but I don't want to drop back out of the top 16 or 17 so I think that their best course of action stay there at 14 take the best player available and you know live with what you select. I mean, the other issue the Eagles could run into is we talk about, you know, we would trade back, but in a draft where there's not, you know, yeah, there's, there are some quarterbacks, but there's not, you know, I don't think, you know, it, it would surprise me if in the top 15 picks, all three quarterbacks were taken. So the Eagles might run into a position where, I mean, you called it a sweet spot, but they might run in, into a position where they're too low to try to get into the top 10 and they're not high and like, I don't know what team is going to be trying to trade up. I mentioned Houston, which is a possibility, but the Eagles might find themselves at 14 sitting there. Not a, not a lot of offers to trade back. You know, they haven't traded up at this point. So I just think the more I look at it, I think the Eagles are going to potentially have to end up reaching at 14. I don't, you know, we'll see, we'll see what ends up, what ends up happening. But I think trading back, even though Matt and I both agree we would do it. You know, you have to have a good offer on the table. You don't just click a button and you move back to 22. So it'll be interesting to see what teams are trying to move up, what the offers are, or if the Eagles decide just to sit there and take the top guy on their board. We'll end with this one. And, I, yeah, I, I think that's going to be the most fascinating part of the first round, not even just who they take, but, you know, because we know how he likes to move around. How he's not a guy that likes to stay still. He either moves up, he moves back. He does a lot of different things in these drafts, what they do before they even take a player at 14. So we know how he is in charge of this whole thing. We talked about him to start this. But I've noticed, guys, the Eagles have gone out of their way to trot out Joe Douglas a lot 
since this offseason began. First, he was in studio uh, with Angelo Cataldi on WIP. Then he was out there at the owners' meetings. Like, anytime they have a chance, they'll, they'll remind you. Joe, Joe Douglas is part of this now. And Lurie, at the owners' meetings last week, said, look, he's going to set the draft board. And they've reiterated that. Your best guess, and I don't expect anyone to know this until you know the draft comes and goes, and, and you guys probably will find out how it, it kind of went in there. Your best guess, we'll start with Matt, we'll end with Elliot on this, how that combination you think is going to work. I mean, I think in theory, this could really work, right? If Joe Douglas is as good as they, they say he is at setting a draft board and evaluating prospects and how he can read the room, right, and trade up or trade down and know where guys might go compared to what else is in the league, like that marriage, Matt, probably could work if they each play to their strengths. What do you think about this Joe Douglas, Howie Roseman uh, pairing as we get set for their first draft together. Yeah, I, I think that Joe, if this succeeds, if if this collaboration works and it goes as they plan, and it's Joe Douglas who builds the board, sets the board, and Howie essentially makes the pick, or as you said, reads the room with teams across the league, and if they opt to move up or move back, he pulls the trigger on trades. If it works, I think this is a short-term marriage because I think that th- after a year or two of being the second fiddle to Howie Roseman, Joe Douglas, if this thing pans out and they can add the requisite talent over the next year or so, he's going to be highly coveted to be a general manager somewhere. So if it works, I think that it's going to work out best for Joe Douglas and the Eagles are going to, in the short term, get the kind of players that can be the core on both sides of the football that you're building for a potentially championship contending team a couple of years down the line. But I have my doubts whether it's going to work. Right, because we, we saw the marriage between Chip Kelly and Howie Roseman blow up after what? Less than a full football season. We've heard how many names of how many personnel directors and talent evaluators who have left that organization because they couldn't work with Howie Roseman. Now, I give Howie credit. He went away during the year that he was essentially polishing free weights and managing the cap as the the second fiddle on the business side to Chip Kelly making the personnel decisions. If he went away and learned the kind of lessons that he talked about a year ago, then I think there's a chance that this could be a very good short-term marriage for the Eagles and potentially for Joe Douglas. But there have been too many examples over the last decade of people not being able to work alongside or underneath Howie Roseman that I don't know how confident I am that it's actually going to work out the way that a lot of Eagles fans and a lot of people hope that it does. Well, if you're if you're an Eagles fan, the hope is that at the end of the day, yes, Joe Douglas is being trotted out there a lot more than I can ever remember their put, them putting out at number two. I mean, he was he was at the press conference for Alshon Jeffrey, even in Arizona this past week when um you know they made the Chris Long signing and Howie was going to talk about it for a few minutes. Howie's standing there, um you know outside at the Arizona Biltmore, we're all kind of sitting there waiting around for him to start. And before he starts, he goes, Joe, why don't you come in here and answer some questions? So they're they're clearly trying to make Joe Douglas a known quantity in this organization. I mean, you know, when, when Chip was here, he had uh, Ed Manowitz, but he he wasn't super talked about a, a ton, and he wasn't in the public eye a lot. But when Howie was in charge before, I mean, who, who his number two was wasn't put put in charge in in the, the spotlight as much. So they're clearly trying to make this sound like a deal where Joe Douglas, as you said, Joe, and as Jeffrey Lurie said, he's going to set the draft board. But at the end of the day, how he's still making these picks. Now, if you're an Eagles fan, your hope is Joe Douglas says to Howie, all right, here's the four guys I would take from. And the, the list of four guys he's, he's giving Howie a choice of are better than the four guys Howie could have came up with on his own. And then Howie picks, and you know, from there, ultimately, we'll see if it was the right one. But yeah, I mean, Howie's still going to be making these picks. So is it, is it a marriage? Is, is it something that I think is going to work? I, you know, I don't just because I don't think Howie's a good general manager and ultimately he's still the one that's going to be making these decisions. But, you know, the hope is if you're an Eagles fan that Joe Douglas is able to kind of scout Howie out of making this, making bad decisions. All right, we'll end with this uh, for this episode, Matt's first episode here on the No Auto Show. I'll, we'll do this every week leading into our final podcast before the draft, which is April 27th on that Thursday night in Philadelphia. From each of you, give me your gut right now. And, you know, it doesn't matter if it's wrong. You could change it next week. But your gut right now, if the draft is tomorrow, Elliot, we'll go with you first and then mm-hmm. Matt. The Eagles at 14. Let's, let's not project trades this. Let's just go with if the Eagles at 14 will select. Yeah, I mean, I've written this on the site. Um, I think at this point it's going to be John Ross. I think he he 
makes sense in terms of somebody that will be there at 14. Um, you know, I've, and I think he fits their long term need. We, we talked about, we've talked about on this podcast a ton about their need to get a developmental receiver that can be here with Carson Wentz for a long time. Now they have Alshon Jeffrey, but he's only here on a one year deal. Torrey Smith, they, they view him as a, you know, they, they talk about him. You know more about how he is a guy off the field than they do on it, and they only give him five hundred thousand dollars guaranteed money. So I don't think they're very confident he can be a long term option on the other side. Jordan Matthews will be in their slot, so John Ross fits in this team perfectly in terms of constructing an offense for years to come. Obviously, he can stretch the field. He ran the four point two two and the forty yard dash, you know, and that's exactly what this team needs. I mean, the reason we heard them link to Deshaun Jackson was because they need somebody to stretch the field. And John Ross, you're getting somebody that's about eight years younger than Deshaun. Obviously not going to cost as much money. And I think, you know, is going to fit the best available player there as well. I think he's someone that you're not going to reach for a cornerback. Um, I, you know, I've said before, I don't think Marlon Humphrey is going to be there. Um, so if I were the, you know, as of now, I think the Eagles best bet, what I think will be the pick um, is John Ross. Yeah, I like that one. I'm a big fan of that kid. Matt, with the 14th pick, the Eagles select. Yeah, I've been pretty consistent, Joe. Every mock draft I've done has had two players. One, Sidney Jones, who we know will not be the pick because of the injury. And two is Alabama corner Marlon Humphrey. I think he's a physical corner. He's not afraid to tackle, not afraid to make the big hit. He's decent enough in coverage that you can start him right away opposite of a Jalen Mills. And we got to remember that in the wide nine, a lot of times it's the cornerback that's up there helping in either pass rush or setting the edge against the run. Humphrey did that a lot at Alabama. Saban left him on the island a lot on defense. I think that the cornerback position is unquestionably this team's biggest need. I don't think that it's a reach to take a corner because I think you could see six to seven with a first round grade at that position. And I think that Humphrey from many of the mock drafts I read is projected to go somewhere between pick 11 and pick 16. I think that he fits exactly what the Eagles need on defense. I would plug that hole. I would take Marlon. And Humphrey, I'd feel good about it. And then I'd start looking in round two, whether it's a D.D. Westbrook, whether it's a Chris Godwin, whether it's later on in the draft and it's the kid out of Baylor, I'd go get that speedy wide receiver sometime in the later rounds because at wide receiver, I have Alshon Jeffrey. And even though it's a one year deal, you can still have the leverage of the franchise tag. You, you have a Torrey Smith who I'm higher on than a lot of people because I think he took a significant step back because of the situation in San Francisco rather than his his talent so that I think you can get your wide receiver later plug your biggest need with one of the most talented cornerbacks in this draft on defense and I think that you have a chance at 14 as Elliot's been saying all along of taking best player available whether it's on offense or on defense getting a guy who can step in and play right away I would hope that player is cornerback because right now it's Jalen Mills, a banged up Ron Brooks, Patrick Robinson, and a handful of players on futures contracts and arguably the second most important position in Jim Schwartz's defense. So I wouldn't be upset with a John Ross or a Corey Davis or a wide receiver, but I think Marlon Humphrey is and should be the pick. All right, so we have John Ross from Elliott. We have Marlon Humphrey from Matt. I will go with Christian McCaffrey, mostly just because I want to see it, and I'd love to see him in the Eagles' offense. I think he'll be there at 14, uh, and I, I think he'd be just a tremendous fit for what Doug Peterson does offensively. So that, that'll be my pick, and, and we'll see how these evolve over the next couple of weeks as these rumors come out and you guys get more of a feel for these picks. We'll be back next week to start looking at specific sides of the ball in this draft, and then we'll do that the following week as well, and then uh, it'll be here. The NFL draft is going to be here in a few weeks. Thanks so much for listening, Matt. Thanks uh, for hopping aboard and, and being part of your first episode here. Looking forward to the rest of the fun, guys. Should be a great season. Thanks as always, Elliot. Yep. Talk to you guys soon. And thank you, all of you, for listening to episode 63 of our No Huddle Show. iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can find ours. Leave us a rating on iTunes as well. We'll be back next week on NJ.com. 